Hey there, I'm Autumn, the host of the Commonplace Podcast. I'm going to give you a second to connect my face with my voice because here it is. Um, we're doing something a little bit different this week. I obviously am making a video for you as an additional resource for this week's episode, which is episode 9, Twaddle Dee and Twaddle Dumb. If you haven't listened to it yet, you don't really need to to watch this, but it might be helpful. We're obviously talking about twaddle and living books, which are two huge ideas in the Charlotte Mason world. So if you don't know, if you haven't heard it or you haven't read it, uh, the Commonplace exists for a mission to bridge the gap that I see between the starting line of the classical homeschooling journey and all of the resources that already exist in the classical world. And there are a lot of them and they're really great. But what I've noticed is that they are geared towards educators who are at schools or moms who already have a handle on some stuff. You need to know the vocabulary, the basic foundational elements, even some of the larger ideas before you can deeply engage with some of those resources. They're kind of overwhelming when you first pull them up. So what I want to do is help take those high ideas and ideals and bring them down to the dirt. And that's a phrase that a um, friend slash mentor slash boss of mine used to use. And the idea is that you take something large that you can kind of understand in this theoretical sense, but you bring it down to the dirt like a garden gnome would. You roll around in it until you see how it impacts every part of your life. You get a really strong handle on the practical side of something. And that's what I want to do. So um, it's really important to me to equip mom with principles over here at The Commonplace. I would be delighted to know that you have gone to a library book sale and you were able to comb through all those piles of books and be like, yeah, this probably a living book, this probably twaddle, as opposed to just pulling up a list of Autumn Kern's favorite living books and just buying them right off my list. I love lists like that. I'm not knocking lists like that, but I would much prefer you be able to go and understand how to find these on your own because that'll better serve you in your homeschool and it'll be more fun for you and your kids. So I have a stack of books right here that I pulled from my kids' shelves. Um, I was delighted to find so many great books. I mean, I know they're on there. We read them all the time, but also I did, uh, did come across a twaddle. So I picked out a twaddle for you. Um, and that is a good reminder for everyone that while <laughs> I love to talk about the beautiful ideals in this education, I myself am striving towards them and trusting that God will take those strivings and make them into works of grace. Because, um, I mean, could you just imagine what Charlotte Mason would say if she found twaddle on my shelf? So, okay, we're gonna start with these two first. Miss Rumphius and uh, Island Boy. Barbara Cooney wrote and illustrated both of these. There's also Rocks of Oxen, which I'm pretty sure my kids have put in for their read aloud recommendation in the newsletter which you can totally sign up for if you want to. But um, these are great to start with because we can look at the illustrations. That's actually one of the key ways that I am able to quickly identify if a book will probably be a living book or not. Um, and it's fun for my kids. They've kind of caught on to what is a beautiful picture in a book. And when we're at the library, they can usually find them, which is pretty great. So a couple key things. People look like people. <laughs> they look like normal people with normal bodies and they're not cartoonish, they're not weird looking, they don't have crazy eyes or anything. Um, and also the color palette is a natural one. These are real colors that you would see out in the world. Um, there is a little, there is a level of subjectivity to deciding if a book is twaddle or living. Um, but generally speaking, we can understand what I think, I think we can understand what I mean um, by natural, orderly, realistic images. So again, there's Miss Rumpius at the library. Okay, so partly with this is a language thing. And I'm gonna open Island Boy here. I'm just gonna kind of flip through, see what we find. We'll start on the first page. So a lot of children's books will have uh, silly idle talk or um, kind of nonsensical ideas. Like they just repeat the same words and phrases and the book kind of skips around. I have an example of that one. It's my twaddle, my twaddle pick. But here we have, um, let's see here, a phrase like spiky spruce trees facing the sea or it was Pa who felled the trees and cleared the north end of the island. These are real, um, real, real sentences full of words that call a child up to think higher thoughts, not dumbed down thoughts. They invite a child to build a mental image. They're words that adults should be using around children, that they can um, have language to then express their ideas and engage with people of all ages around them. You want to use the language in a book in order to build your child up, not to bring them down. So. We have those. Um, now right here, I love this book. It's How Do I Love Thee? It's a spin on, is her name Elizabeth Barrett Browning? Is that the, hang with me guys. Yep, Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, she wrote the famous poem, How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Ways. So this book is a spin on it for children, but again, let me show you. So these slightly different illustrations, still really beautiful. Um, but then the phrases, you know, I love thee deep, 
and wide and high. So it's not that there are a ton of words on the page. You don't want to go too far above your child's level. You don't want to distract them with the, with the book or the page um, or overwhelm maybe what their minds can handle, but you can still use little language and use it well, right? I love thee in soft sunlight and rain drizzled night. Kids know what a rain drizzle night is. They know what soft sunlight looks like. This helps connect them, uh, connect their ideas to things they're reading with the natural world around them. And of course, the, for the five and under crowd, which I do mention this in the podcast this week, um, Charlotte Mason's primary concern is that your child has many natural relationships with the things around them. It would be much better for your child to go outside and enjoy the soft sunlight than to read a bunch of books about the soft sunlight. But when you do all of that, when you have this holistic approach and you know, all of life is education, and you do have your kids outside, and then you come in and read a book like this, it can give them language to describe that soft sunlight. Um, okay, this one right here I know has been in the commonplace note. It's the Seven Silly Eaters. This is a favorite at our house, but I would tag this as light reading, which is totally fine to do. Um, it's a fun story about a mom with seven ridiculous eaters. They all eat one thing. It's all different. She has to make it all. <laughs> I think every mom could like look through here and be like, ah, oh, yes, I'm to see myself in this book. However, um, it rhymes. It's cute. The language is not dumbed down or anything. It's not a cu like a cutesy sort of terrible written <laughs> book. But, um, you know, here, here's a bit. When Peter had not yet turned two, another baby, sweet and new, was born. Dear Lucy, small and fair, with big blue eyes and curly hair. So my kids have caught on to it. They have most of it memorized. We laugh and giggle about it. I would call this light reading. I never say no when this book is taken off the shelf. We love this book. Um, but it might be something that, you know, doesn't have big, large ideas <laughs> that would maybe inspire a child towards play or something like that. But it is an enjoyable book that we all like. And now, lastly, I'm going to give you this one. I don't think anyone is going to come at me with a pitchfork for this, but do remember that if this is like a family treasure to you, um, you have that right. <laughs> Dragons love tacos. Autumn does not love this book. I do love tacos. They're an inspiring idea. But um, this book is, it's almost like a cartoon that like a modern cartoon which would split really quickly between this frame that frame this idea this this part of the story and you don't really see the connecting thread in fact there is no thread or plot line that is what this book reminds me of the first couple times i read it to my kids uh they were delighted by it dragons tacos funny things like that um but i kept wondering like what how are these pages connecting what is the story that we're doing here and it uses the same language over and over again, which is usually the sign of a twaddle book because it doesn't um, continue to build on any idea. It'll just keep saying the same few phrases over and over. Um, but my kids enjoy this book. And so we don't read it all the time. It's never what I go grab for myself. If they pick it out, I'm happy to read it to them. And that is my final point for today, is that think of books like a diet because our mind needs to be fed just like our stomachs. And so you can't eat Chick-fil-A every single day, right? But Chick-fil-A is a great treat. It's a lot of fun to have sometimes, but the vast majority of your diet needs to be nutrient dense food. And that is what these other books would offer. So there's no need. In fact, I wanted to say in the podcast, please promise me that you will not go raid your children's shelves for at least a week after you listen to today's episode, because there is some flex room there. And, um, also, something that I say to my friends in real life is that Charlotte Mason is not God, which sometimes people need to hear. Um, and so it can be a great thing to snuggle up on the couch with your kids, with all of your favorite books. Um, and I think it's something that knits hearts together in a family. It builds family culture, and it also opens the doors of imagination for your children. And so it's worthwhile to ensure that your, your shelves and your library picks are full of living books. Um, but I want to make sure that I, that I say that no one has a perfect bookshelf and there is no perfect final single list of books that you should have. But by just looking at a couple of things, you can quickly identify which books you're bringing into your home and how they'll best serve and delight your family. So quick recap before I go, cause I do hear my youngest peeping upstairs, um, twaddle. You're going to have silly idle talk probably going to have really ugly illustrations. You're going to have dumbed down language and you might not have a plot line at all. Pretty easy list to think through. Also, a lot of contemporary books will have like political agendas or uh, recognizable characters in them. That's like 
an asterisk over here. I don't want to make it a fifth point, but it, it should be a consideration on the list. Living books, on the other hand, are going to have beautiful illustrations. They're going to inspire action as well as idea. They are going to call a child to a higher order or um, a life of virtue. So even in something as simple as Island Boy, he lives his whole life on this island, making it better, serving those around him. And then at the end of it, he dies. Like, it's a full life. Um, it's a full life of good, hard work for the benefit of others. That kind of concept. Um, and then lastly, Totally forgotten which order I went in. Did I say beautiful illustrations? Probably. Um, but the language itself will be well written, excellent, like excellent picks for words. So I hope that helps. I hope this video <laughs> encourages you on your book hunt because us homeschool moms are keepers of the bookshelf and also lovers of the books. I'll talk to you guys soon.